As Mircea said, I am the Chief Information Security Officer of Nuclear Electrica. Uh, Nuclear Electrica is a Romanian uh, government-owned company and we are operating a nuclear power plant in Cernavodă and also a nuclear fuel factory near Pitești in uh, Mioveni. And uh, for sure we are dealing with a lot of uh, uh, technical OT security stuff. Uh, we are protecting uh, a very complex uh, nuclear environment, two reactors, can do reactors. And uh, today I will discuss about uh, a project that we initiated uh, as, by the way, uh, as we are um, innovating on the, you know, common energy things like trying to implement in Romania a small modular reactor uh, technology, we are keeping the same track on the cybersecurity and uh, we are developing the first Romanian information sharing and analysis center. It is uh, actually something that we, we, we started two years back when we applied for uh, European funding uh, and we were accepted because as an introduction, at the, uh, at the European level we have the NIS directive, most of you know about that. So in the directive we have some domains defined for essential service providers, right? And European Commission, and actually m most of the cyber-related uh, uh, organizations at the European level said, yeah, for each of them, we should have an ISAC. But what, we are, what we'll do at the national level, because we have critical infrastructures, like in energy, healthcare, and so on, and so banking, right? We should encourage the organizations the biggest organizations from each country to develop locally an information sharing analysis center. And this was the, let's say, long story short, how this project uh, uh, was initiated. First, I want to present the mission because it's very important to, to set uh, like a common understanding for everybody to, to, to see how an ISAC can help the organizations. I know maybe not all of you are working for uh, an energy or electricity related organization, but for sure it's something that can be applied in other uh, industries, like in health, in uh, healthcare, or in uh, banking. And there are many very mature uh, ISACs, like FS ISAC, financial services ISAC, uh, in, 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 in the market, let's say. So we are trying to, to bring together on the same table organizations like Nuclear Electrica. And we have, for example, as uh, initial members, uh, Hydroelectrica, uh, a similar organization as, as they are operating hydro uh, 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 power plants. We have Romgas, they are the, the gas, natural gas producer in, in Romania, and many others that are now in discussions with us to become a member. It's not like a very easy... Uh, application because we are trying to 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 keep only the the important members at this phase and later on we can uh, for example allow like the uh, smaller organizations from the from the energy also we have the support from the Romanian directory for for cyber security they are giving us very useful and valuable support of, in developing this project. And we have Academia in Research, we have uh, Ichi Bucharest, and we have also service providers. And the first one is Science Institute. They have a booth here in, and they are presented at this uh, conference. And now let's define what an ISAC do and what we are doing for Romanian energy sector. We are trying to identify the, the prioritize intelligence requirements because intelligence, threat intelligence as a concept, and there are many vendors in, in the market that are providing, they are delivering threat intelligence services, threat intelligence feeds. But, you know, there are millions of IPs, millions of IOCs. How should I handle all of them? What, which of them are applicable for me? All those threats are applicable for me? Maybe not. I want to be more focused on the threats that are applicable for my industry at least, or to my organization, right? And for that, there is some effort that should be engaged. And uh, honestly, I didn't see in, in the market like uh, 
very uh, focused threat intelligence feeds that can help organizations in this, in this way. But this is the reason why the ISACs you know, were, were developed across the globe. And there are, as I said earlier, very mature ISACs with very long practice in, in, the, in, the, in the field. Uh, second, we, is something that, because geopolitically, is, we are near a, a, a war zone or, or area, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, right? We need to understand better our enemies, right? Not all the organizations have the, uh, the resources or the skill set to start you know, digging deeper uh, on, the, the, on the threat actor's behavior. It's not very easy to see exactly what is the TTP, what is the tactic, technique, and procedures used or you know, developed by a specific threat actor, maybe a Russian threat actor. That is time consuming. You need to know the, to, to have the, the skill set. And the nice second can in place and help organizations with such things. Uh, also, I, we, based on the discussions we, we had with our members, we identified uh, another kind of need. It's not related with threat intelligence. They, they want to have uh, uh, a trusted community of peers to discuss with. They want to sit together and say, okay, let's now dissect, for example, NIST directive or law 362, right? There, there is a, a order coming from uh, the Romanian director for cybersecurity. There are some requirements from there, but how should I implement them in a very complex environment? Because for such organization as Nuclear Electrica or Hydro Electrica and other similar, it's not very easy to say, okay, let's implement a vulnerability management program and in two months I will, I will be done with that. No, you have at least three types of environments. You have IT environment, business IT environment, you have OT environment, and you have physical security environment, right? And each of these subdomains of cybersecurity, as I said, vulnerability management, it requires more effort or, you know, a specific skill set to enable you to do that. And maybe some lessons learned from other peers or, you know, some uh, guidance from other peers is useful, is, is allowing the, our members to implement their, uh, the, the low requirements more easier, right? Sorry, <laughs> push on the, uh, yeah. So these are the, the main uh, capabilities we defined. Uh, outside of threat intelligence order and the threat intelligence sharing, we, we said, okay, maybe it's better to define something like awareness. Because awareness, I'm not saying that it's very simple to be done, but it's something that is uh, more easier, right? And very useful, and the benefits of doing that are very clear. But we can, in the ISAC, we can define a framework. For example, if I want to do, I don't know, awareness on spear phishing, okay. The same template I'm working on, I can share it with my peer from Hydroelectrica, and he can take it, save a couple of hours doing that, just customizing it a little bit, and then use it internally, right? Training, the same. We have pretty much the same needs. We know what are, let's say, the, what is the skill set that we need, and where we want to invest in the skill set that we, we want to have, right? and we can approach together that. Or the ISAC can deliver training, right, for, for the members. Uh, other initiatives. Uh, as this ISAC uh, project, there are other projects, of course, with European funding or not, doesn't matter, but can be done together with other peers. It's just, if you want to see this ISAC as a community of communities, and the community of projects can allow the members to develop the projects together, right? Various things. Uh, guidelines and frameworks. Here is similar to what I said earlier. Uh, I don't know, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework or uh, NIST framework for risk management, 837, I think. Right? That, if it can be downloaded from the NIST uh, webpage, but uh, if somebody who already implemented it, 
yes, okay, so it can have some lessons and, and can give me some insights how to do that, right? That can be discussed, but I cannot discuss that, you know, public with everybody because I, I'll give him some, uh, you know, details about the gaps that I have or there are some details, confidential details that I cannot, you know, make, it, uh, make them public. So that is the reason why we want to have this trusted uh, relationship between the, the same sector uh, members. And the reports, uh, the threat intelligence reports, not only the feeds. Uh, we are delivering, for example, monthly threat intelligence reports for our members. And uh, is, uh, those are helping them to, to, to guide their effort, to identify the threats that have a bigger chance to, to, to impact them, right? As I said, for example, I don't know, banking trojans are is something that, you know, opportunistically can impact my organization. But something similar with black energy, three, can impact me, right? Can, is something that can be used by similar threat actor or by same threat actor against me. But when somebody is reading a threat intelligence report, sometimes they see, okay, I see this, I see this threat actor, those details about them, is targeting these organizations, but I have my specifics in my organization. How should I implement it? And we want or not, in Romania, we have our own specifics and nobody can understand uh, you know, energy sector organizations better than us. And in those reports, we are putting recommendations that are applicable for them. We know, based on the projects, common projects uh, implemented by governmental organizations in Romania, we know pretty much what technologies uh, Nuclear Electrica has or Hydroelectrica has, and we can do recommendations, focused recommendations to mitigate that, uh, that threat, not general ones. Okay, just to dig a little bit deeper on, on the threat intelligence side, which is not only data, right? Uh, it's not just an IP. That IP will make more sense if I will link it to a threat actor. I will give him a confidence level, okay? Because today, for example, an IP can be used by a domain, but the same domain tomorrow will have another IP, will respond to another IP, right? Or I need to see how accurate is that data. Should I block it? Maybe I will block a business-related service in my organization. You know, a billing system will go down. My clients will not be able to, to access the, the uh, mobile application for billing or you know, sending data to, 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 the, to the electricity organization. So for that, we need to have a confidence level to trust that the, that data is accurate and I should block it, right? Also, regarding the TTPs, right? I want to understand exactly what are the tactics, techniques and procedures used by the threat actor. I need to actually to put all these four uh, puzzle pieces together in order to understand what is applicable for me and what is not applicable. I'm not saying that not applicable means to ignore it. No, but we don't have like unlimited time, money, tools to ingest, you know, all the IOCs or, and uh, all the threat intelligence data across the world. We want to s focus and mitigate the threats that are applicable for, for me. So we want to understand the capabilities that that tractor, uh, a threat actor has. Why? Because I want to see where I should implement, you know, mitigation mechanism. Maybe it is in the border firewall or it's just I need to do some monitoring in my SIM solution and that's it and trigger an alert whenever the thing, bad thing is happening. Right? I want to understand what victims that threat actor is targeting because as I said earlier, it's important to see if I can I be uh, targeted or not. And also I want to understand the, the, the infrastructure. All these things if are, 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 are you know, put together will enable the consumer or the member of the ISAC to take the right, the right decision. As you can see on this slide, starting with basic IOCs, you know, from a threat intelligence feed, you can take a malicious IP address and block it or just put it in a watch list or a SIM correlation rule and that's it, you'll get an alert. And that is technical threat intelligence. I can do something tactical. 
But if I link it to a threat actor, okay, and understand better what's going on with that bad IP, and I get also some TTPs saying, okay, this IP is used for exploiting log for shell. Good is something else that, you know, just a bad IP, right? Is maybe saying, I'm not using any Java application and, you know, this log for, shell, log for J library is not using my Java environment. So maybe I is not, you know, the right time now to consume like five minutes to add a firewall rule, right? I have something more important. And uh, in this way, you can be able to identify more systems that can be impacted by your environment, in your environment, and defend more efficiently, right? And the last steps, like uh, the last phases of, the, uh, in, you know, contextualization of, the, of a threat intelligence feed, they are representing the, uh, the operational part of uh, threat intel. Again, there are some questions that threat intelligence and not a simple IOC can answer. For example, what, where, and when, right? We can, for example, saying we have the atomic indicators from, uh, from MISP. We can say this IP is telling me from where it's coming, right? I have the who is details and I can say it's coming from Romania, it's coming from Russia. Right? And how is the answer that can be answered by the TTPs? Because it's defining the entire behavior of the, of the, of the attacker. Or, you know, specifically behavior of a campaign. Right? And why and who will say us the trend landscape? Is that type of report that is saying, is giving us the context. Usually it's done based on uh, some historical data. It's not only for, like a snapshot from a couple of days is done for, history, for data collected for, for months. You need to uh, uh, identify, have telemetry, collect data, uh, uh, aggregate it, and see some trends, identify some, uh, some patterns in the behavior, and then you can resp respond to these uh, questions, why and who. Because, for example, maybe you saw it, a lot of commercial Vendors are saying, uh, APT, I don't know, muddy water is coming from Iran. How they identify that? Very easily, they were watching the adversary. Is better, you know, like the art of war. You need to know your adversary if you want to have a bigger chance to, to win that war, right? All these three types of threat intelligence deliverables can be consumed internally in, by various teams. The tactical part can go to the SOC team to fire all directly in an automated way. The operational one, the SOC analyst to understand and contextualize a threat alert when they are doing the triage or analyzing it, or during the incident response. You are, you are breached and you see, okay, I have communication with uh, this IP and I saw some hashes doing bad stuff there. Okay. Uh, but you see only a small piece of the, of the campaign. But somebody else in a threat intelligence report, maybe they already said, this is the entire list of the hashes. You, you can use it and search for, for, for in your environment for, for it, right? And the, the, the strategic deliverable is more dedicated for CISOs or CIOs, C-level usually, right? They need to, to have enough insights in order to take the right decision for example, saying, yeah, I see this trend going up. A ransomware now, an incident, a ransomware incident now costs more than three million per, you know, in, in average. I should invest more money in my, in my cybersecurity uh, uh, team, right? Now, I want to go, because I, I said that is, is a light one, but from technical point of view, it's not just going in a web application, user interface, and just see what's going on there, right? We are using MISP, it's a well-known application for threat intelligence and easy to be integrated with, uh, with other MISP solutions. So the core functionality is sharing by default, and it's something that is our, is, is something that we want to, to have. This is the core business of an ISAC, to share information with other members. Anyone can be a consumer and, or not. Now, 
for example, we have members that they are, uh, uh, sorry, they, they, are, they are consumers, but they are not contributors. They are saying, okay, I don't have in, in internal capabilities to be able to, you know, analyze, uh, uh, I don't know, to do reverse engineering, to, to, to extract IOCs from, from my uh, security alerts. Okay, that's fine, fair enough, but they can be consumers, and they, there are two, two, two types of consumers. Let's say the, the mature ones, which did an API integration with our MISP, and they are consuming our data and you know, sending it directly to security controls to be blocked or monitored, and the basic ones, which are you know, users that are going in the web interface and uh, you know, watching, the data, you know, watching the data, extracting only what they, they, they want to extract from there, and, and, and that's it. Uh, as I said earlier, and as you can see here, it's very easy to, sorry. Okay. It's very easy to integrate the multiple MISPs because we have one member and it is a uh, Romanian director for cybersecurity, they have their own MISP, right? And we want to collect data from them and contribute to them. That can be done MISP to MISP, right? And there are galaxies, there, there are organizations that can be defined in the MISPs and the data can be segregated very, very easily because I don't want to share everything with everybody, with any member that I have in the ISAC. We are using the TLP protocol, and for example, only with the trusted members, other energy sector players, we are sharing the, the, the TLP red data. TLP amber is, for example, shared with academia research and uh, NGOs and government. In, so it's very easy to, to support the such practice in, 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 a, in an ISAC. How it, it is working very easily, they can implement a MISP or not, is like, you know, they need the hardware first and then they should uh, just read the, uh, the installation, uh, uh, installation guide and uh, that's it pretty much because also from the security point of view, everything is described there. This MISP project, by the way, was uh, also, they have a, a, a European founding and uh, now it's pretty, pretty mature. You can, so the member can put the, uh, the MISP in their environment or just, you know, uh, log in in our web interface. Then they can connect to the thread feeds based on their membership level and extract the data. IPs, file hashes, domains, TTPs. By the way, MISP is using uh, the most important uh, uh, standards for threat intelligence, TICS, TAXI, and that's very easy to, to be, uh, to, to get the data in the structured way. Uh, then it is, they can connect to trusted providers. Trusted provider means an ISAC as us or other sources. So we'll enable them to be more uh, connected in the threat intelligence world. And then they can just query and uh, update the security controls based on what they are seeing uh, in, in, in the environment. Uh, MISP in ICS environment because Synergy ISAC is for energy uh, organizations, energy companies, and they have huge OT or ICS environments. As, and most of the networks, for example, in our reactors, the networks are air gapped. You cannot just, you know, from home I can do configurations, you know, or maintenance, troubleshooting in my, in my networks in, in the OT environment that are air-gapped, so what can I do? I can just very easily get the data on a USB, go to a security cache or, you know, a security appliance, scan it with multiple AVs, you know, do whatever I want to from security point of view, and then I can get the data in my air-gapped environment, put in a local MISP there, and consume it, because in OT, we have security controls, and they know about taxi, they know about sticks, they can, they are able to consume threat intelligence. Right, and if somebody thinks that uh, air gap networks are very well protected just because they are not connected to the internet, that's not true. Just I just want to remember about Stuxnet and many other cases uh, when air gap networks were uh, breached, and not just breached, as in Stuxnet case when they stop or they, 
actually modify some uh, parameters of a PLC. No, it's, just, it's about also data exfiltration. They can exfiltrate data from air gap networks. Good. Now, because uh, I kept this more catchy slide uh, for um, as is just the, for the final uh, uh, part of my presentation, because threat intelligence is about sharing, and this slide is increasing a little bit the concerns that we should have in this field. Uh, by the way, uh, manufacturing by is something that is not I'm, uh, is some, that I'm saying is said by uh, by many vendors in the market. Manufacturing became the most targeted industry after uh, in this year. Usually for the last three, four years, banking was the most targeted one. But now manufacturing is on the first place. And this is something that is changing the role of the game because you know the attackers said, okay, banking is very well regulated. They invested a lot of money in cybersecurity, a lot of, sec a lot of security controls there, but manufacturing and OT, IOT, ICS environments, mm, not too many, because if you are looking to the cybersecurity uh, market for OT security, they are teenagers, right? <laughs> they just start building solutions, mature solutions for, for, for protecting ICS environments. And energy and oil and gas together, they are on the fifth place. This is something that also is important to, uh, to, uh, to, to see and take actions based on, on such information. I mean, like a, somebody which has the decision power in an organization, when they see things like this, tomorrow they should start doing something. And as you can see on the map, we have, for example, in Germany, in the uh, first nine months of the year, from January to, to September, they had four critical infrastructure compromised by uh, various uh, threat actors. I know Rosneft is a Russian company, but they breached the German breach, the, the, the German office, right? Oil and tanking, another one. We have in Japan, Kojima and Denso, right? And many, many others. And I can give you Colonial Pipeline example, Samsung, Toyota twice in two years, once with ransomware, the second time was just a data breach with uh, confidential data which was exposed. And these are big organizations. They know how to do cybersecurity, but the environment is pretty complex. You need to, to see how you should put a cybersecurity program in practice in a way that it should be flexible. Because if a procedure, for example, is saying do this, this, and this, okay, in one year it will be obsolete. And by the way, something, there are many uh, uh, experts in the, uh, in, in the field saying that we should have an incident response plan only for ransomware because it, that is another animal, right? If I'm following the common IR procedure or plan that I'm using for uh, business email compromise, that will not work efficiently for ransomware, right? Because, you know, if I, in business email compromise, maybe I, if I want to, you know, recover, I should reset some passwords. But from a ransomware, the, the recovery phase is totally different. And in global organizations, that thing is not very easy to be implemented. And some predictions and statistics for OT security. 89% of manufacturing, oil and gas, and energy companies have experienced cyber attacks in the last 12 months. 89%. I know in that group we put all the companies around the globe or where we had telemetry, right? Telemetry means Synergy ISAC through the feeds that we are collecting from, the, uh, from vendors or public feeds, but we are aggregating them. The average cost of a cyber incidence against OT is now 2.8 million. It's still less than the average for uh, a, a cyber incident, which was like last year 3.4 million or something like this. 2.8 million is, much, is, too, is too much, honestly. I mean, I know ransomware and paying the ransomware is increasing the average cost. It's not just the cost to recover or to mitigate an incident, 
is the overall cost that is bringing. Maybe you need to shut down your uh, plant. That means in, for any energy uh, organizations means to start buying uh, energy from the market because you have contracts and need to deliver it to, to, the, to, the, to the clients, right? And so the cost is increasing, you know, is actually double. In OT environments, uh, around 10% of attacks are determined, uh, determined by removal media uh, devices. You'll say, oh, man, <laughs> how this is still happening? Very easily, because you have contractors. You need to get projects, uh, configuration files for your PLCs, for your HMIs. They need to go inside or the plant with some documentation and other things, right? And that is a, a risk uh, that they are bringing with, uh, with, with the USBs or removable media they are bringing. All the regulators, for example, in nuclear field, are saying that this is the biggest threat that we should mitigate. And if we are comparing with IT, is three times more that uh, is, it is in IT, right? So this is something for OT that, uh, uh, you know, the guys in, in the room that are working in, in uh, OT environments, they should maybe go and see how they should uh, modify the procedures, update the procedures that they, uh, they have in place for, for mitigating this. And the vulnerabilities in OT environments, they're representing 65% uh, of total. I will say that is not possible. No, no, it's possible. Because, uh, for example, I don't know, Microsoft Exchange. Somebody identified a CV in 2020, but in the next Tuesday patch, it was mitigated. It's closed, it's not reported anymore, right? But in OT, Siemens or Honeywell or, I don't know, other vendors, they not just go and release a patch for a PLC or RTU over the night. They need to take time to test it, to see how the operations will, uh, will uh, be impacted. And there are situations when they are deciding to say, we'll not patch it. That's it. Uh, please apply other mitigations in, in, the, in place to, to, to block the, the exploitation of that vulnerability. And in this way, we come in this place where the 65% of the vulner total vulnerabilities are represented by OT vulnerabilities. And by the way, you may be, and is the case for all the organizations, you cannot go and replace uh, a, 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 a digital system from your environment immediately because it cost is part first of a system that is controlling a huge process in the organization and maybe it costs like one million, two million, three million, I don't know, up to 100, 100 million. That was for today from my side. Uh, I just want to say one more thing. If in the room are other, I don't know, representatives from organizations, from critical infrastructure organizations, from other domains, or I don't know, not energy. I know energy, everybody's now looking on the energy bill and is talking about energy, but healthcare is very important. Banking, as I know, I, we don't have an ISAC in the Romanian banking, for Romanian banking. Anybody who wants to start a such initiative, we can discuss because the benefits are very clear and the value added that uh, the members will see if they became a member of an ISAC. Thank you, Thank Cosmin. You. Um, guys, let's have a hand for Cosmin. Do we have any questions in the audience? Yes, we do. Coming this way. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I have one question. How do you manage the trust in an aspect in motivating the contributors to, con to continue contributing, not only consuming? First is uh, giving him feedback, right? basic thing. If somebody is contributing and uh, you know, is valuable, for example, no, I will give you very clear examples. Uh, now, our members are not saying, I saw this incident happening in my environment, I want to contribute with intelligence to share with other members. No, they're saying, we saw in the wild happening this, 
not to me, but I think it can happen to the other members, right? And they are, you know, contributing. We are giving him feedback, saying, okay, good, because most probably other members will see the same, th the same behavior happening in their environment or not, but sooner or later they will see somewhere in the news or in other threat intelligence feed saying, yeah, is, uh, I, I saw that and now I can say it was valuable. Right? And there are other, yeah, please. So it's or not, maybe I, I, I didn't get the point. It's not me, boss. Yeah. I, I didn't get to, hacked. Oh, okay. Next question over here. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation, Cosmini, and I'm glad somebody's doing such an initiative in Romania. Just wanted to add, so I'm familiar with healthcare ISAC, HISAC, and uh, how their governance structure works and how they have a board of directors that's yeah. responsible for this. How do you plan on implementing in this one the, the governance model and making sure, as uh, the previous uh, interviewer asked also, uh, making sure the accountability and the mandate is, uh, is there so people can share, use the information and be active in the community? Yeah, we're taking the advantage of using technical tools first for sharing, right? Uh, MISP is allowing us to mark the data using TLP, and that is easy to say. These users in the platform have access only to TLP, I don't know, amber or below, right? Uh, so from this point of view, is pretty easy, right? Uh, from the government's point of view, we have uh, uh, a board of, uh, uh, board of the board of ISAC. We have a chairman with two years mandate, mandate, and it can be re-elected third times. <laughs> it's like in democracy, uh, but we're still in the development phase. Uh, we still need members. And now we're discussing with other uh, uh, organizations from Romanian energy sector, and we start looking also in the region because. Uh, we are uh, members of European Energy ISAC. They are very mature. They started in 2015. And uh, they encourage us to take the leadership in the region saying, okay, what you are doing is nice. Let's go, for example, in Bulgaria and say, see if there are uh, uh, energy organizations from there that they want to become member in, in your ISAC or to help them to, to develop a local ISAC in, in Bulgaria and other countries in the, in the region. The governance model is not easier. We, we, we use to have, you, we have two parts. We have the capabilities, which represent, which is actually what are, we are doing, and the deliverables, and some tax forces, and we have the steering of mechanism of this uh, ISAC. It is founded by European U Union. Okay, so we still have money one year. Uh, after that, maybe Nuclear Electrica will continue to support it for a while, and then will uh, switch you know, the entire ISAC to an ONG. I mean, uh, we'll not reinvent the wheel. We are doing what other guys are doing. Okay, so we have two questions. Gentlemen uh, on the left sure. side. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions. So, how do you deal with uh, keeping the bad indicators out. You mentioned that everybody is uh, contributing. How, how, how we are keeping? How you, how you are keeping bad in indicators out? Out? The, yeah. Uh, out from the MISP. From the network? Yes. No, from the MISP. From MISP. MISP? Ah, how we are protecting the MISP? No, no, no. How, how, how you do you filter out bad indicators? Ah, okay. Bad indicators means low confidence and, ah, okay. Yeah. So, the, usually, all the sources from where we are collecting data, the data is coming with a confidence level. Then we have multiple phases before we are delivering or sending out the data from our MISP. We are analyzing it, we are trying to see if it is accurate, we, we can maintain the confidence level or not. If we are decreasing the confidence level, that became inaccurate data, let's say, and that will not be sent out to the, to the members, okay? So, we, we have a process a threat intelligence process, a process starting with collecting and you know, continuing analysis, analysis, analysis uh, deliver and so on. And also what we have uh, and what we implemented is the prioritized intelligence requirements. Because not all the data is important for us. As I said, we have only, for example, around five 
threat groups that are important for us and we are monitoring them closely. Okay. We don't want to deal with the, you know, the effort you know, and spread uh, the focus on all the threat groups in the world. Awesome. Two other questions, Lucian. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I have a question. <clears throat> uh, what is the, do you have any relationship with, the, because we, we have the NIS directive in Europe, right? The, the Network and infra, uh, Infrastructure Security Directive, which mandates the creation of CSERTs and uh, uh, NIS authority. Yeah. Uh, and also there's an ISA uh, at the European level, right? So. Uh, do you have a relationship with the Romanian CERT or whoever is the authority in Romania for, for this sector uh, and also at the European level with ENISA and other, um, other um, similar organizations? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, uh, uh, when we started the project, we got a support letter from Romanian. I, I think at that point was still CERTRO. And we got a support letter from, from them, okay? And now we are uh, doing, for example, uh, uh, in common, we are doing various, uh, for example, conferences, trainings, we are doing them together. And uh, they are helping us to develop this project. We got, very nice, we, we got very nice support from their side. And also at the European level, we are in, con as I said, we have a memorandum of understanding with European Energy, ISAC and using the and the NISA as well. So, yeah, we are in touch with all the most important players. Also, uh, as a comment, uh, Lucian, at European level, NISA is uh, handling secretariat for the NIS uh, committee. They're not uh, pushing out policies or, or something like that. The decisions are not made by NISA. They're made of board. Uh, of representatives coming from all member states. And the agency that does cybersecurity like on hands for um, all the European Union or European Commission and European Parliament is CERTU. But they also coordinating? No, they're not coordinating. No. That, that's actually the point. The member states take decisions and they are ensuring that everyone has the same da data. Okay, if there are uh, one, one, one more question here, and then we have some, <laughs> some questions over here. Uh, I wasn't thinking we'll that my presentation will raise a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, very nice presentation. Thank Thanks you. for it. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, at least for now you prioritize what's relevant and important as a threat for you. Yeah. And you also mentioned Stuxnet, <clears throat> which was a basis for a lot of other attacks in different fields. Uh, recently, the Chilean uh, observatory was attacked. I was wondering if you'll also, let's say, expand to a more general view, because a lot of malware or threat actors uh, adapt and reuse something from one domain or field to another. Yeah, yeah. For, you know, we, we have ransomware as a service, for example, right? And if various modules of a piece of malware can be reused by other threat groups. But as I said, we are trying to see what are the threat groups that we want to keep in monitoring mode, right? Even if they are using pieces from other campaigns or other threat groups or, you know, they have similarities, yeah, that can be done. But we don't want to, we want to keep our focus on what is important for us, right? That, this is the, let's say, a very important thing that we want to, to keep in place. So, last question here, uh, and after this, I'm going to have to ask you to please uh, approach Cosmin in the, in the break and ask him whatever you feel like. So, last question. Thank you. So, at the global level, the way of improving security is by having transparency on breaches and on vulnerabilities, and this would trigger to improve the security. At the other side of the spectrum in Romania, everybody is praising how good we are and how experts we are, uh, but not sharing our vulnerabilities and our breaches. What do you think we should do in order to learn from the global practices or they should learn from us? Yeah, the most important thing is to create the right context. For, if you don't trust somebody, you will not be transparent, right? I, I cannot be candid with somebody that I cannot trust, right? So the ISAC is 
this is the f maybe the most important thing. We are trying to create the context for other organizations in the same uh, sector to trust others, right? To have com this is communities of communities, trusted communities of co community of communities. Sorry, right? We are trying. It's very easy because I mean I I wasn't expecting to see you know this. Uh, uh, level of uh, transparency from the members, but they saw the benefits. I say, if I'm not, I'm not contributing, I will not get, you know, what I need <laughs> from, from the member, from the other members, right? And I, we have a motto, don't navigate cyber alone. It's not doable <laughs> in these days. Thank you, Cosmin, for your uh, presentation Thank you. and uh, Thank for you. the answers that you've provided.